Chapter Four of Man, King of Mind, Body, and Circumstance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrea Fiore. Man, King of Mind, Body, and Circumstance by James Allen. Chapter Four bodily conditions there are today scores of distinct schools devoted to the healing of the body a fact which shows the great prevalence of physical suffering as the hundreds of religions devoted to the comforting of men's minds prove the universality of mental suffering each of these schools has its place in so far as it is able to relieve suffering even where it does not eradicate the evil for with all these schools of healing the fact of disease and pain remains with us just as sin and sorrow remain in spite of the many religions disease and pain like sin and sorrow are too deep-seated to be removed by palliatives our ailments have an ethical cause deeply rooted in the mind i do not infer by this that physical conditions have no part in disease they play an important part as instruments as factors in the chain of causation the microbe that carried the black death was the instrument of uncleanliness and uncleanliness is primarily a moral disorder matter is visible mind and that bodily conflict which we call disease has a causal affinity to that mental conflict which is associated with sin in his present human or self-conscious state man's mind is continually being disturbed by violently conflicting desires and his body attacked by morbid elements he is in a state of mental inharmony and bodily discomfort animals in their wild and primitive state are free from disease because they are free from inharmony they are in accord with their surroundings have no moral responsibility and no sense of sin and are free from those violent disturbances of remorse grief disappointment etc which are so destructive of man's harmony and happiness and their bodies are not afflicted as man ascends into the divine or cosmic conscious state he will leave behind and below him all these inner conflicts will overcome sin and all sense of sin and will dispel remorse and sorrow being thus restored to mental harmony he will become restored to bodily harmony to wholeness health the body is the image of the mind and in it are traced the visible features of hidden thoughts the outer obeys the inner and the enlightened scientists of the future may be able to trace every bodily disorder to its ethical cause in the mentality mental harmony or moral wholeness makes for bodily health i say makes for it for it will not produce it magically as it were as though one should swallow a bottle of medicine and then be whole and free but if the mentality is becoming more poised and restful if the moral structure is increasing then a sure foundation of bodily wholeness is being laid the forces are being conserved and are receiving a better direction and adjustment and even if perfect health is not gained the bodily derangement whatever it may be will have lost its power to undermine the strengthened and uplifted mind one who suffers in body will not necessarily at once be cured when he begins to fashion his mind on moral and harmonious principles indeed for a time while the body is bringing to a crisis and throwing off the effects of former inharmonies the morbid condition may appear to be intensified as man does not gain perfect peace immediately he enters upon the path of righteousness but must except in rare instances pass through a painful period of adjustment neither does he with the same rare exceptions at once acquire perfect health time is required for bodily as well as mental readjustment and even if health is not reached it will be approached if the mind be made robust the bodily condition will take a secondary and subordinate place and will cease to have that primary importance which so many give to it if a disorder is not cured the mind can rise above it 
and refuse to be subdued by it one can be happy strong and useful in spite of it the statement so often made by health specialists that a useful and happy life is impossible without bodily health is disproved by the fact that numbers of men who have accomplished the greatest works men of genius and superior talent in all departments have been afflicted in their bodies and today there are plenty of living witnesses to this fact sometimes the bodily affliction acts as a stimulus to mental activity and aids rather than hinders its work to make a useful and happy life dependent upon health is to put matter before mind is to subordinate spirit to body men of robust minds do not dwell upon their bodily condition if it be in any way disordered they ignore it and work on live on as though it were not this ignoring of the body not only keeps the mind sane and strong but it is the best resource for curing the body if we cannot have a perfectly sound body we can have a healthy mind and a healthy mind is the best route to a sound body a sickly mind is more deplorable than a disordered body and it leads to sickliness of body the mental invalid is in a far more pitiful condition than the bodily invalid there are invalids every physician knows them who only need to lift themselves into a strong unselfish happy frame of mind to discover that their body is whole and capable sickly thoughts about oneself about one's body and food should be abolished by all who are called by the name of man the man who imagines that the wholesome food he is eating is going to injure him needs to come to bodily vigor by the way of mental strength to regard one's bodily health and safety as being dependent on a particular kind of food which is absent from nearly every household is to court petty disorders the vegetarian who says he dare not eat potatoes that fruit produces indigestion that apples give him acidity that pulses are poison that he is afraid of green vegetables and so on is demoralizing the noble cause which he professes to have espoused is making it look ridiculous in the eyes of those robust meat-eaters who live above such sickly fears and morbid self-scrutinies to imagine that the fruits of the earth eaten when one is hungry and in need of food are destructive of health and life is totally to misunderstand the nature and office of food the office of food is to sustain and preserve the body not to undermine and destroy it it is a strange delusion and one that must react deleteriously upon the body that possesses so many who are seeking health by the way of diet the delusion that certain of the simplest most natural and purest of viands are bad of themselves that they have in them the elements of death and not of life one of these food reformers once told me that he believed his ailment as well as the ailments of thousands of others was caused by eating bread not by an excess of bread but by the bread itself and yet this man's bread food consisted of nutty homemade wholemeal loaves let us get rid of our sins our sickly thoughts our self-indulgences and foolish excesses before attributing our diseases to such innocent causes dwelling upon one's petty troubles and ailments is a manifestation of weakness of character to so dwell upon them in thought leads to frequent talking about them and this in turn impresses them more vividly upon the mind which soon becomes demoralized by such petting and pitying it is as convenient to dwell upon happiness and health as upon misery and disease as easy to talk about them and much more pleasant and profitable to do so let us live happily then not hating those who hate us among men who hate us let us dwell free from hatred let us live happily then free from ailments among the ailing among men who are ailing let us dwell free from ailments let us live happily then free from greed among the greedy among men who are greedy let us dwell free from greed moral principles are the soundest foundations for health as well as happiness they are the true regulators of conduct 
and they embrace every detail of life when earnestly espoused and intelligently understood they will compel a man to reorganize his entire life down to the most apparently insignificant detail while definitely regulating one's diet they will put an end to squeamishness food fear and foolish whims and groundless opinions as to the harmfulness of foods when sound moral health has eradicated self-indulgence and self-pity all natural foods will be seen as they are nourishers of the body and not its destroyers thus a consideration of bodily conditions brings us inevitably back to the mind and to those moral virtues which fortify it with an invincible protection the morally right are the bodily right to be continually transposing the details of life from passing views and fancies without reference to fixed principles is to flounder in confusion but to discipline details by moral principles is to see with enlightened vision all details in their proper place and order for it is given to moral principles alone in their personal domain to perceive the moral order in them alone resides the insight that penetrates to causes and with them only is the power to at once command all details to their order and place as the magnet draws and polarizes the filings of steel better than curing the body is to rise above it to be its master and not to be tyrannized over by it not to abuse it not to pander it never to put its claims before virtue to discipline and moderate its pleasures and not to be overcome by its pains in a word to live in the poise and strength of the moral powers this better than bodily cure is yet a safe way to cure and it is a permanent source of mental vigor and spiritual repose end of chapter 4 recording by andrea fiori